so you don't believe in God. Is what you have to realize is that science today operates under what we call methodological naturalism. Evolution does not work no matter how old the universe. Well, it's good to be with you uh, this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. And I, and I come before you not as one who has figured it all out or has all the answers. I'm, uh, I'm a student and learning uh, as much as many of you are. And so uh, I, I'd like to talk with you about some of my understanding of the way I see things. And I, I don't, uh, I do welcome questions and discussion and, and certainly we'll have time for that after this uh, to talk about some of these concepts and, and to discuss uh, what we think about it. So thanks to uh, uh, the folks here at Jacksonville as well as to Apology Express for, uh, for having this session. So I wanna talk about mutations and natural selection and this is a big deal. Uh, in science, we're taught that, uh, as you see there on the screen, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. That's a quote from 1973, and there are many people that still fully believe that today, and I would like to challenge that concept and suggest that uh, we have to really be critical of, of how we view statements like that. I do want to define for just a moment the, the difference in the different types of evolution. There are a lot of different concepts of evolution, right? We talk about the idea of uh, uh, broadly, as Jeff did last night, about the origin of, of the cosmos and things like that, which would be more cosmic evolution, but then you have chemical evolution, the idea of where did life come from, how did life originate, uh, but what you and I generally think of when we hear the term evolution is more about biological evolution. Where did, where did all of the diversity of life that we have today come from? In fact, that's really what Darwin's question was about. He really wasn't asking a question about where did the universe come from, or even where did the first life come from? He didn't even argue that in his book, Origin of Species. Darwin's argument was about where did all of the diversity of life that we have today come from? Uh, and so he made some assumptions about that. Uh, but the big picture is what you have to realize is that science today operates under what we call methodological naturalism. And so everything has to be explained by natural means, natural methods, natural concepts. And so we rule out anything supernatural. And uh, I think there's some problems with that because if we're really searching for the truth, we have to acknowledge that there may be questions that science cannot answer naturalistically. And that there, are some, there is the possibility that truth exists outside of the naturalistic realm. And I'd like to suggest to you, I, I believe that is the case. So neo-Darwinian theory though in the modern era takes Darwin's idea and, and amplifies it and says, all right, there's, there are three kind of unifying concepts here. One is that life arose from non-life, and so again, this isn't evolution per se, but it's often assumed to be the source of life forms. And as Dr. Houts correctly uh, uh, noted last uh, hour, there are a number of people who believe uh, that life could not have originated here naturalistically, therefore it had to come from space, including uh, uh, Sir Fred Hoyle, as well as Dr. Francis Crick and others uh, that believe that concept. Uh, the second point is that all organisms share a common ancestor. There's universal common ancestry. There was one life form and everything came from that. And then the third concept is that of natural selection. Uh, so this idea that natural selection serves as a source of novelty and complexity in organisms as we see them today. And so I'm not gonna spend time on this, but I think there are plenty of questions about the origin of life. How could it have happened? How could the molecules have originate? How could they have stayed around long enough? Why didn't they break down too fast? Et cetera, et cetera. I think there's a lot of questions. Uh, don't do this during the talk, but later you can Google James Tour and nano dragsters or nano cars. This is a synthetic chemist uh, from Rice University who uh, designs basically designs vehicles that are molecular scale vehicles. They're so tiny you can't even see them. It's fascinating science. And what uh, James Tour said in an article for Inference Review last year, he says, from the data, the synthetic chemists can easily deduce that under the prebiotic conditions, the reaction in question would not likely yield anything useful. With each added step, difficulties are compounded so Im by improbability so overwhelming that no other field of science would depend on such levels of faith. Abiogenesis research would never be accepted in any other area of chemistry. The field is its own best enemy. The idea there being origin of life concepts from a naturalistic concept, there's no mechanism for how life could have originated naturalistically. What about universal common ancestry? This is a major issue. Homology is probably the strongest argument in this area. And homology is the idea that there are 
um, commonalities of form, structure, biochemical function, and if we have these commonalities, maybe that means everything is related. And this is probably one of the most convincing arguments for uh, our students in our biology classes and other places that are looking at this saying, wow, these, these bone structures are really similar. Does that mean that these organisms just evolved in a long gradual line? And I would argue that that's one interpretation that you could make, but there's an alternative to that. It doesn't require that there's ancestry. It could also mean that there is common design, common design features. And these common design features and principles are things that we see all the time. In fact, engineers know this, right? The folks who designed this building didn't have to reinvent the wheel. They understood there would need to be doors and windows, ceiling, lights, all the different things that come with a building, such that we live in an environment just like other organisms. We're eating the same types of food sources, carbon-based food sources. We have to have the same fundamental biochemistry in order to deal with those food sources. And so there's a lot of commonalities between us and other organisms. We have common design. It's not common descent. I believe it's actually common design. And this quote from New Scientist, this is an uh, uh, evolutionist speaking here and quoting other evolutionists saying, for the past, much of the past 150 years, biology has largely concerned itself with filling in the details of the tree of life. Quote, for a long time, the Holy Grail was to build a tree of life. Says Eric Baptiste, an evolutionary biologist at the Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, France. A few years ago, it looked as though the Grail was in, within reach, but today the project lies in tatters, torn to pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence Many biologists now argue that the tree concept is obsolete and needs to be discarded. Quote, we have no evidence at all that the tree of life is a reality, says Baptist. That bombshell has persuaded some that our fundamental view of biology needs to change. Now, you're not going to see this, young people, in your textbooks for quite a long time. Textbooks are 10, 15 years behind the curve in terms of what's going on in science. But importantly, also, Quotes like this aren't going to make it into the text because it undermines the, the paradigm that many want to promote in our society. And so this, this type of quote is, is this, these people get attacked for saying things like this. Even when they're honest about the evidence, they get attacked by it. And so it's really interesting. Uh, but what you realize is happening and is shifting is the idea that, that there was one original life form, like you see there on the left-hand side, that gave rise to all the diversity of life we see today. That concept is, according to that last quote, becoming obsolete. And now there are other models that are coming up, like what you see on the right-hand side, where maybe there were multiple original life forms that then, over time, were able to swap things back and forth and eventually gave rise to all we have today. Now, that doesn't answer a lot of the problems that exist, right? Not only do you have to explain the origin of one life form, now you've got to have multiple life forms that all originated all around the same time, all with the same fundamental biochemistry, and all with the ability to interact with one another. So it really just compounds the problem more, but what you see on the right-hand side actually fits some of their genetic data better than what you see on the left-hand side. And so you can see this, pro this is really unraveling at the seams, and I think we're not going to have time to talk about this. If I'm going to remove a concept, I want to give you one, though, in its place. I think the concept of created kinds makes more sense of the data. That in the beginning, God originally created kinds of organisms that are genetically distinct, dog kind, cat kind, whatever, uh, and that those kinds have remained genetically distinct over time, but yet have given rise to the diversity we see today. Farmers understand this. Dog breeders understand this. right? You, we have the capability to isolate out lines that we want to breed and continue to grow. And so those types of concepts, I think, fit very well with the creation model so that you could actually have speciation. And if you're interested in that, you can look up this concept of baraminology, and it gets back to the Hebrew terminology uh, that describes uh, a creation, as Dr. Rogers talked about last night. So how does biological evolution take place? Darwin said, I'm convinced that natural selection has been the main, but not the exclusive means of modification. Okay, that's, that's fair. Uh, more modern, uh, this is a, an atheist, uh, uh, materialist atheist, Dr. Alex Rosenberg. He's a philosopher of science. He says the source of demystification here can only be the theory of natural selection. He says, in The Origin of Species, Darwin made two broad claims, both of them about what happened on the Earth over a long period. 
and what caused it to happen. He says, the common descent of large but finite number of particular biological systems on the planet and the importance of natural selection as the source of diversity, complexity, and adaptation. This is an interesting thing. Is natural selection capable of generating diversity as Dr. Rosenberg here is claiming? Interestingly, Kirshner and Gerhardt back in 2005 acknowledged that really what we have to realize is that natural selection is not a source of variation. Look at their quote. There are limits on what selection can accomplish. We must remember it acts merely as a sieve, preserving some variants and rejecting others. It does not create variation. In fact, Dr. Rosenberg in another book acknowledges this very same point. He says the process takes the variant trait in each generation and filters them for fitness. He, that is Darwin, should have called it environmental filtration for the process that Darwin envisioned gives, uh, gives nature only a passive role. That's a really critical point. Natural selection in and of itself has no power to create variation. It's a filter. It's a sieve. It is selecting things. How do we illustrate this? Uh, in fact, Hugh, Hugh DeVry uh, noted this back in 1904. Natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. In other words, it, it is not creating the variation, it's selecting among the, the possibilities uh, and filtering. And it might look something like this, go with me on this analogy here, uh, and I, this is courtesy of, of a friend of mine, Dr. Paul Nelson. If you imagine you've got some different organisms here, uh, and some event comes up, some selective event, maybe some pressure, whatever, and it just so happens that after that filter, uh, you've got some blue that still survived, but there's more yellow. Now suppose another event takes place, another selection process comes about uh, that filters further, and B is now eliminated as an option because it wasn't the fittest, and now yellow predominates uh, in this particular scenario. So here in, in this sense, selection is, is acting as a filter to uh, preserve those things that are best fit uh, to survive. And so it's not creating the variation, but it's selecting among in, in the sense of being a filter or a sieve. It's not an active process, uh, but rather something that is taking place. So we, sur we summarize that as survival of the fittest, but again, what does it mean to be fittest? That's a whole nother realm of debate that philosophers of biology and biologists acknowledge. It's really hard to define what is the fittest. How are we going to define that? Is, is that based upon reproduction? Is that based upon some other feature? Uh, and so fitness is a really hard concept to define. But the big picture that I want you to take home about natural selection is that it does not create variation. And so the question is, well, where does variation come from? If selection acts as a filter, what's creating the variation that's giving us the options among which we're selecting? All right. Several examples that you have from maybe in your textbooks, things like that, you've been taught about peppered moths fruit flies, Darwin's finch beaks, etc. I think these are great examples of variation. I think they're great examples of even adaptation, natural selection. I'm okay with that. But what are they not showing us? They're not showing us new novel features and functions that are being developed. And I think that's a really critical distinction here. Uh, if, our, if our goal in, in terms of understanding evolution is to understand how simpler organisms could give rise to more complex features and functions, We've got to have a mechanism for how that takes place. Selection is only a filter. It's only filtering out things that aren't going to work. So what's actually creating the variation that's giving us something to filter? And so it's understood by neo-Darwinists that selection is not sufficient, that you also have to have mutations. So not only do you have selection, but you've got some way to, for variation to come into being, and that's this idea of uh, mutations. Uh, and so what, what we need to be able to demonstrate evolution is we need to be able to demonstrate where new features and functions come from. How are these new things arising? Where do they come from? Uh, and what we realize is that this in a biological system happens in the context of, of our genome, of DNA. So we have to have changes in our DNA, changes in our genome to be able to explain these things. Could be genetic information, could be what we now understand to be epigenetic information. Uh, but mutations would be the source of this variation. So the question is, do mutations give us a good way to understand where new features and functions come from? So really quickly, to go back and understand a mutation, I want you to understand what our DNA is. 
So a mutation would be a change in the genetic information. And if you uh, look at this, changes can take several forms. You could have individual letters be changed, uh, as we call them, uh, nucleotides. You could have insertions, deletion. What does that look like? Well, if you look down there in the lower part of the screen, we've got uh, a sequence there, A, T, G, etc. Those would be the letters in your DNA. If we change some of those letters, there are only four letters in this alphabet, by the way, A, C, G, and T. And so if we change one of those, that's going to have a consequential change in other levels, RNA, protein, and those changes would then bring about potentially changes in the organism. All right, so there's a connection here. DNA influences what's made as RNA, which then influences the proteins that are produced from that. So there is a connection. So my analogy is that the genome can be thought of as a book. Just like books have uh, chapters, paragraphs, sentences, words, letters, your genome is kind of organized in a very similar structure. In fact, it's much more computer code-like, uh, really. But genetically, our alphabet has four letters, and those four letters come together in long strings to make genes, and genes are organized into sections within our genome, uh, and there are other pieces of information that tell you what chapter you're on, what sentence you're on, etc., that are all part of the book that we call our genome. So imagine if we have a book here, we take your favorite or least favorite textbook, students, whichever one you want, take a textbook and start changing letters in it randomly. Is the textbook information going to get better or worse? Right? Are we going to have more information at the end of the change or less information? In some cases, you may say, well, I hated the textbook to begin with. It's a lot better now with these mutations, right? Imagine, though, taking a textbook and going to a copy machine, and every time you copy it, you make an almost perfect copy, but there's maybe a few changes. And then you take the photocopy that you got off that has the changes, put it back on the same copy machine, and make another copy. What happens? Well, the copy machine is imperfect, so in this case, you're going to get more changes. And over time, you keep repeating that process, what happens? you start losing information. You start messing things up in a very significant way. And that's what happens. Uh, parents, you pass on to your children 60 to 100 new mutations. I passed on to my kids 60 to 100 new mutations. They're going to pass on to their kids. And that's now in the context of a genome that's 3 billion base pairs or 6 billion for the diploid. That's not a whole lot. You know, 6 billion letters versus 100, 6, 60 to 100, that's, you know, that's a very small number. But at some point, some of those mutations are going to hit really critical places, and it's going to make an effect. And so understand, there is, there is an accumulative effect of that. So what types of mutations could we have? Could we have things that give us a gain of function? What about maybe a modification of some existing function? Or what about even a loss of some function? Could we see those things? And I think the answer is yes. You could see all of those possibilities. Now the question is, what effect are those going to have on the growth of an organism? Because I could have, for example, a gain-of-function mutation that may actually be detrimental to the organism. I could have a loss of function that may be actually beneficial to the organism. And so when we talk about mutations, sometimes we say, well, there's no good mutations. you really got to define that more clearly. All right? Are you talking about a gain-of-function or a loss of function? Is it beneficial or is it detrimental? There's more questions that you have to ask, in other words. And I'm going to illustrate this here in just a moment. But what I want you to have an appreciation for is that the discussion's a little more complicated than just saying there's no good mutations or all mutations are bad. Right? That's, that's oversimplification, and that's not really being honest with, with what actually is happening biologically. So we have to ask the question, what types of mutations are occurring, and what effects are they having on an organism? And that's a really, really important question. So the examples that, that are typically given as beneficial would be things like sickle cell disease, uh, e. coli. We're going we're to talk about a couple of these in the next few minutes. Sickle cell disease results from a mutation in the protein for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein that uh, is in your red blood cells that transports oxygen from your lungs through uh, the bloodstream to all of your tissues, picks up carbon dioxide, and returns it to the lungs so you can exhale it and continue living. Hemoglobin is a really critical protein. It is produced in red blood cells. Red blood cells have a lifespan of somewhere around 120 days. Um, and then they, they die off, they go into senescence, they get recycled, and more red blood cells are made. If you have the sickle cell mutation, you have uh, basically a mutation that causes your red blood cell or your uh, hemoglobin to clump. 
So there's a valine amino acid that has what we call a hydrophobic side chain that binds into a pocket of an adjacent protein. Now all of a sudden these hemoglobin proteins clump together and in that clumping, uh, they can actually cause the cell to change shape. And so they form that sickle cell that you see in the image there. Uh, and that sickle shape uh, actually is really bad because when those blood cells get to your extremities, they clog up uh, in the veins and, and uh, in the pathways there as, as they go out into capillaries. And it causes swelling and extreme pain in the individuals that have this particular condition. Now, if you have two copies, it's really severe. Uh, and those individuals oftentimes have to take the anti-cancer drug hydroxyurea to promote the production of fetal hemoglobin. If you have one copy, it's far less severe, but you still have risk of exertional sickling after working out really intensely or being involved in like military training. In fact, the military were the people that discovered that. The benefit of this mutation is that you have resistance to malaria, and people who have one bad copy who live relatively normal lives do have resistance to malaria. People with two bad copies, of course, a much more severe scenario, uh, but also have resistance to malaria. So it has a benefit to it, but what is it? It's, it's actually a loss of function, right? We've lost the ability to make good versions of hemoglobin, or at least partially lost it in cases of heterozygote. And, and so, in essence, can you call this an unequivocally good mutation? I would argue it's a mixed bag, right? The benefit is, if you're in an area where there's malaria, you've got protection. The bad side is you've got a whole lot of other health consequences. I have a student uh, that I teach who actually has this condition. She and I have had a number of conversations about, uh, about the disease and about the effects it has and about the, the drugs that she has to take to overcome all of the side effects and, and problems that are associated with it. She would argue it's not a good thing. In fact, she's told me such. So what about um, bacteria? Haven't we studied bacteria and aren't they evolving? Well, probably the best uh, long-term evolution experiment that we know of is in Dr. Richard Linsky's lab at the University of Michigan. They've been growing E. coli, which is uh, bacteria that's present all around us. It's in your gut. It's everywhere uh, for a long, long time. And over time, they've measured whether these organisms are becoming more fit. Now, their measurement of fitness is, do they grow better? In other words, are these growing faster than other cells? That's a fair question to ask. But then you ask, Okay, so they found bacteria that grow faster. What types of changes have occurred? And you can actually find online different databases that will show you the changes that have occurred in Linsky's cell lines that have allowed them to grow faster. And I've summarized a few of those on a table here for you, and I don't expect you to be able to read through and uh, necessarily understand all of the biochemistry. Uh, but what I want you to see is that these are five of, the, five of the best known mutations. There are others, but these are five of the best known bacterial mutations from his studies. You can see the associated publications there on the right-hand side. But what I want you to look at is in the third column, mutation type. What is the actual, these are beneficial mutations. Every one of these allow these cells to grow faster. They allow the organisms to be more fit in the context of a shaking culture flask, okay? Remind, remind yourself that. It's an artificial environment. In that context, these mutations allow those organisms to grow faster. If you look at the third column, what, what type of mutations are they? They're all either loss or modification of function. What do I mean? I mean, in most cases, something that normally functions is now broken. And in one case, there may, it may just be a slight modification of a function. So we're not seeing any new functions in any of these examples. And I think that's a really powerful statement. This is the longest running evolution experiment that we know of. And they are directly observing, they're able to directly detect the types of mutations that occur. And so the question that we have to come back to is, right, what, okay, so this is, this is what we have. We have loss of function or we have modification of function. And even sit t the last one there, is probably the most famous. Uh, this is where they were able to get bacteria to grow in the presence of citrate. Citrate is a, is a biomolecule that's part of a lot of pathways in our bodies. It's a normal molecule that's produced in metabolism. And under anaerobic conditions, these bacteria can normally take that up. Well, what happened is they mutated such that under aerobic conditions, they could still take it up. And so they were able to use citrate when they normally wouldn't because of a mutation that allowed them to express the machinery that takes citrate into the cell. And so it wasn't anything new, it was a loss of regulation actually, it was a loss of the ability to stop producing those proteins when they normally wouldn't produce them.
And so it's a really interesting thing. Uh, even the sit tree mutation isn't a real great example. Dr. Michael B. he summarized findings like this in a paper in 2010 where he said, look, what we, what we have here is what I call the first rule of adaptive evolution. He said, quote, break or blunt any functional coded element whose loss would yield a net fitness gain. In other words, these bacteria are treating it as if, you know, let's say you started out with a car and you thought, well, what could we get rid of on this car to make our vehicle more fuel efficient? Let's start getting rid of doors, let's get rid of windows, let's get rid of the seat belts, let's lighten the load. We don't need back seats, we don't need this, we don't need that. And you strip the car down and what happens? It still runs, it still functions, it maybe is a little more fuel efficient because you've gotten rid of some weight, but what have, you, what have you given up in the process? You've given up some really critical features. In fact, one of the mutations on the last slide was the ability of the bacterial flagellum to propel those cells. Well, if they're growing in a culture flask, guess what they don't need? They don't need a flagellum. So one of the mutations that allows them to grow faster is a mutation that shuts down the production of the flagellum. It makes sense, right? So they're stripping the car down, but all they're showing us is that they can strip the car down. This isn't development to a new organism. This is stripping the, the organism down to its base level. So what about antibiotic resistance? This is a really important one. I have a number of colleagues in, in pharmacy who are very, very much um, involved in what we call antimicrobial stewardship because it's recognized that there are a lot of bacteria that are becoming resistant to the antibiotics we're using. What's interesting is uh, the mechanisms by which bacteria become resistant aren't as uh, impressive, evolutionarily speaking, as you might think. Uh, for example, one might be a change in, in the actual uh, production of certain proteins. Uh, so we're, we're actually maybe making more of a protein that exports the antibiotic. So increase in antibiotic export from uh, the organism. We might have the duplica duplication or amplification of some of those genes. So if we've got an export protein that removes the antibiotic, what happens if we make more of it? Well, then we can remove more antibiotic, and the cell can, can survive even when there's antibiotic present. What if, we, what if we make changes in the target protein? Whatever protein this particular antibiotic targets, what if it mutates a little bit, and that enables the organism uh, to evade the antibiotic because now the antibiotic can't bind to the protein? That does happen too. But that protein oftentimes, when the antibiotic is gone, can mutate back. In other words, it's a subtle change that can be reversed. Another thing, and this is probably, a, 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 I don't know what percentage of the time this is, but I would think this is a pretty significant part, is that there are a number of plasmids that are uh, small pieces of DNA that bacteria can shuttle around. They can pass these pieces of DNA around. And it turns out that a number of these contain genes that actually can inactivate antibiotics. Now what you and I need to understand about modern antibiotics is that many modern antibiotics are designed based upon naturally occurring molecules. And as such, these are things that have been in the environment for a long, long time. And so the mechanisms to destroy them already existed. In fact, there's evidence uh, from bacterial samples that are, that are believed to be very, very old and to have been uh, in existence long before our modern antibiotics were developed that actually show resistance to modern antibiotics. There's a number of papers out there uh, on the web to, to discuss that in the scientific literature showing that uh, antibiotic resistance isn't something that necessarily has just developed. There's some antibiotic resistance that's existed for a long, long time. In fact, some of these samples are supposedly millions of years old that we're talking about that where they get these bacteria and test them. They're allegedly millions of years old, but yet they're already resistant to the antibiotics that, that we use on them. And so what it tells you is that these mechanisms have existed for a long time, but what happens in, in a patient uh, in, let's say, a healthcare setting, you start treating them with an antibiotic, let's say that a small number of the population of bacteria in them have the ability to resist that, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to wipe out most of the bacteria probably, but then you're going to have a remnant that survives. And after several days on the antibiotic, what happens? It flares back up. This happened to my daughter over Christmas. She had an ear infection, and we got her on some antibiotics. She started feeling great after three or four days, and then after a couple more days after that, guess what happened? She felt terrible again. And we took her back, and they said, yep, well, let's switch her to a different antibiotic. So we went to a different antibiotic. And that's, that, unfortunately, that's how they do it. Now, I wish that 
You know, in our modern time, we could just take a sample and say, here's the, here's the bug that you've got, here's the antibiotic we need. Some of that technology does exist, it's just not something we do routinely because there's a lot of costs involved in that. But the bottom line is antibiotic resistance is not developing new features and functions uh, that are novel to the organism. It's typically breaking something that already exists, overexpressing something that already exists, or passing something around that already exists. And so, uh, to me, this is a, a great example of adaptation. It's a great example of natural selection. Not a good example of uh, evolutionary change. So what kind of mutations do we see? I, I think we, we could potentially see all of these mutations. Beneficial, undetectable, detrimental, gain of function, modification function, loss of function. Now, what would be the hypothesized frequency? And I'm just, I'm just hypothetically saying, well, what would we expect to see? I think most of what we would probably see would be undetectable. Many mutations we can't really detect. They might be modification, they might be loss of function. They might have no detectable effect, though. And so it's important for us to understand it's, this is where it gets really hard. The rubber meets the road. How do we study that? Again, this is not, I'm not saying I know the numbers for all of those. What I'm saying is this is something that I think we need to study and understand on a deeper level. As what types of mutations do we see and how frequent would we expect to see them? Um, I'm going to talk about John Sanford here in a minute, so I'm going to save that uh, for the next. I think there are other people talking about this. Of course, uh, Dr. Michael Behe in his book Darwin's Black Box uh, introduced the concept of irreducible complexity that we may talk about later if we have time. But he also talked about this idea of the edge of evolution. There was a more recent book called Edge of Evolution, and in that book he explored how many mutations does it take for organisms to do something new, to do something novel, and kind of explores what do we see with regard to that from a natural perspective. And uh, what I think he shows us is that, for example, with malarial resistance to chloroquine, which is uh, an agent that's used to fight it back against malaria, uh, or at least the malarial parasite, uh, with malarial resistance to chloroquine, it took at least two separate mutations for those organisms to become resistant, which you can do the math and actually calculate then how big of a population of organisms do you need, how long would it take for that to take place. And so you can do some actual population genetics on those organisms and say, well, every you know, 10 to the 20th organisms, we're going to expect to see resistance pop up to this particular drug. Uh, but what we know is, we, are, we now know what those mutations are, we have a better understanding of the effects of those mutations, and what we're seeing is that resistance, again, is not a case of some new novel function, it's the mutation of something that already existed. There's also a concept called the waiting time problem, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but just the concept that mutations accumulate in a population so slowly and it takes so long for them to become stabilized in a population that it would take a ridiculous amount of time. In fact, one, one study I have quoted here at the bottom says for two nucleotides, two specific nucleotides to occur and get established in a human population would take 84 million years, which is vastly longer than we've been existed, in existence as a species according to the evolutionists. And so that's a huge problem. Uh, if the mathematics of that are correct, then the, the accumulation of the, the correct types of mutations in a human population would never occur. Uh, John Sanford, in his book Genetic Entropy, he's the inventor of the gene gun, which is the way we deliver genes into transgenic crops in most of the cases. Uh, Dr. Sanford suggested that our genomes are actually decaying, and it's due to this concept that we might call neutral evolution. And the idea here is that so many of the mutations that occur in us are so subtle that natural selection can't really select for or against them, right? It can't really filter them out if they're bad because they're so subtle. Now there's really, really bad mutations that get selected against because maybe that individual doesn't survive. But most mutations fall into kind of this gray zone you see in the middle where there's really no ability to select. And they argue that most mutations are slightly deleterious or negative, and so you've got a gradual accumulation of slightly negative mutations taking place over time that you can't select against. What's the problem with that? You have evolution without selection. So we're not going in any direction here. Does everybody follow me? The, the direction we're actually going in is down. If we take uh, what Dr. Miller was talking about in terms of entropy and apply that to genetics, if our genome is accumulating these slightly negative mutations, we're actually getting worse off. So the picture is kind of bleak, if, if Dr. Sanford is correct. Uh, and there's a recent paper from the uh, Annals of New York Academy of Sciences that suggested that beneficial mutations can be detected, but they're very, very rare. 
Um, and uh, the rarity is such that it actually matches with the model that Dr. Sanford uh, has predicted. Uh, and he wrote in his book, he says, look, we've reviewed compelling evidence that even when ignoring deleterious mutations, mutation selection cannot create a single gene within the evolutionary time scale. When deleterious mutations are factored back in, we see that mutation selection cannot create a single gene ever. This is overwhelming evidence against what he calls the primary axiom, which is the, that man is the product of random mutations plus natural selection. And I highly recommend uh, his book, Genetic Entropy, to, to kind of get into that concept of what is this idea of neutral evolution and why is it such a challenge for the mutation selection paradigm. And I think it is a very significant challenge to that. Another important thing is that we are seeing mutations, but the problem is the types of mutations we observe aren't what we need. Take this quote, for example, from Stephen Meyer's book, Darwin's Doubt. Uh, quoting John F. MacDonald, talking about the great Darwinian paradox, uh, Stephen Meyer writes, he notes that the genes that are obviously variable within human natural, or within natural populations seem to affect only minor aspects of form and function. While those genes that govern major changes, the very stuff of macroevolution, apparently do not vary uh, or vary only to the detriment of the organism. The kind of mutations uh, we need for major evolutionary change we don't get, the kind we get we don't need. This is a fundamental problem. You see, when, when we're building a new organism and we need new features to develop, we don't need small changes in, in individual proteins necessarily. What we need are major changes that cause major developmental changes. Well, what we find is that the proteins involved in development are very tightly controlled, such that they do not change very much at all. And because of that, when mutations do occur in those genes, it's typically a very catastrophic failure. In fact, we, can, we see examples of this. Take the fruit fly of, uh, studies, for example. Fruit flies have been uh, used to illustrate this in a number of ways, where you can get legs that grow out of the, the heads of the fruit fly, you can get extra wings, you can get extra body segments, etc. But all of those are catastrophic changes to that organism and actually lead to non-functioning parts rather than to more function. And so uh, what, what we realize is that the developmental control genes that are needed uh, for evolutionists to build new features don't change, uh, at least don't change much at all in living systems because their change would bring about catastrophic changes uh, that, that the organism could not survive. In fact, Peterson and Muller argue this, and these are evolutionists. This is from Evolutionary Biology in uh, 2016. Only after a trait is present in a rudimentary form and if its expression contains some variation that can be selected on, the population genetic mode of variation may take over to refine a novelty. In light of these findings, and despite perpetuated assertions to the contrary, like those from Ptoima, microevolutionary events are insufficient for explaining discontinuous forms of change and phenotypic novelties. The idea that small, continuous, incremental variational change is the sole cause of phenotypic evolution continues to be challenged by qualitatively discontinuous changes that are needed to be accounted for by evolutionary theory. That's a very deep and long quote. Let me, let me back that up and, and unpack that for just a moment. What he's saying here is that, look, we observe changes. They're, they're arguing we do observe, uh, for example, microevolutionary changes. But to take those changes and to say that would then over time explain these larger discontinuities that we need to explain, he says they, these are just fundamentally two different, two different buckets. Small incremental changes do not bring about vast structural changes to body plans. All right? Small incremental changes could take us from you know, the, um, the fiat to maybe a Cadillac. Okay. Small incremental changes might do that. Small incremental changes are not going to go from a Fiat to, um, I don't know, an M1 Abrams tank. Right? There's a fundamental discontinuity there in that those two vehicles are entirely different structures. And that's what, what we're trying to get you to understand is that to go from one life form into different types of life forms, it's a fundamentally discontinuous type of change where you've got to have some much larger explanation in order to get there. All right. If you look at natural variation in populations, take the population of people we have here today. We've got tall people, we've got short people, we've got skinny people, we've got larger people, we've got dark-skinned dark people, light-skinned people, and everywhere in between. That is the natural variation that I think God has allowed for in the design of His creation, 
which allows us to have all of this variation. But that's not necessarily evidence that we evolved from a different life form, right? It's evidence that within our own genomes, we have the capability to have diverse, uh, diversity. So mutations or changes in genetic information, the longest running experiments that we know of demonstrate uh, that increases in growth advantage come with a loss of genetic information or of genetic regulation, which is, uh, you know, a decrease really in real world fitness. Antibiotic resistance, I don't believe, demonstrates evolution of novel functions. Um, and I think the commonly exa cited examples uh, of solution, uh, of evolution, really are, are adaptation, natural selection, and, and even genetic decay rather than progressive evolution. And gradual stepwise development of new features is not really supported by the evidence. And so just really quickly here in the last few minutes, can evolution develop complex interdependent biological systems? The system I talked about earlier, and that is that your DNA is used to make RNA, which is then used to make protein, is a fundamental concept. In fact, it's called the central dogma of molecular biology. It's a fundamental concept of living systems, that these systems have in them DNA, that DNA gets used, transcribed to make RNA, RNA gets translated to make proteins. Um, some RNA serves its own purpose and doesn't get made into proteins, uh, but we understand that. But these are inherently interdependent. There's a causal circularity here that we have to really grasp on a deep level. And that is, DNA, in order to make RNA, guess what you need? You gotta have proteins. Well, in order to make proteins, you gotta have RNA, right? And to make RNA, you gotta have DNA and proteins. And RNA. You gotta have all of these things together. In fact, protein production from RNA requires RNA, but also requires RNA structures in the form of the ribosome, where, which are complexes with protein, in order to do all of that. So each of these molecules are interdependent upon one another. The products of the processes are required to complete the processes. That's a designed, engineered system that tells you you have to have an explanation for where the system came from in the beginning. It had to be set up and arranged in the beginning. There's a causal circularity here that cannot be explained by a discontinued, just a gradualistic type process. It doesn't occur that way. Take, for example, the number of protein coding genes involved in some of these processes. For example, DNA replication repair in us can take place. It's about 160 proteins, about 30 of those proteins for synthesis. Transcription requires 40 different proteins. Translation, over 100 different proteins. Energy metabolism, somewhere around 70 different proteins. Look at one of the simplest known microorganisms we know of, Mycoplasma genitalium. It's got a, it's got a genome of about 500,000 base pairs. Relatively sm very small organism. Now it's a parasite, it has to, I guess parasite's appropriate term, it has, it, it, it has to live on a host, in other words. Uh, so it can't make all of its own food, so it's got, it's got some things that have been really pared down, kind of like our go-kart analogy earlier. We've stripped off a lot of stuff in this organism. Uh, e. coli, for example, has five million base pairs, so this has ten times less DNA than E. coli. What does it still have in order to survive? It's got 30 proteins to do replication, it's got ten different proteins involved in transcription, a hundred different proteins involved in translation, and still over around 30 proteins involved in energy metabolism. In fact, uh, it's been determined in the laboratory setting that it requires about 382 different genes just to survive. This is one of the simplest known organisms that we have. It has to have 382 different genes, and those gene products, of course, have to be produced, which requires all of the components to exist to produce those, right, in order for that organism to even survive. So the question is, how do you even get a, a simple organism like this? But remember, this one is dependent upon host organisms, which are much more complex and provide a lot of the nutrients. So we get this thing to grow in the laboratory because we can feed it whatever we want, right? We can, we can actually provide it everything it needs. But if it's going to live in the environment, where are all its nutrients going to come from? Right? It's got to have some way for those things to be provided. So point being, there's, there's a causal circularity here where, where we have to understand this engineered system has to have all of its components together to begin with. They don't just come together in random assortments. In fact, Darwin said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous slight successive modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And again, Mueller and, and Peterson, their quote, the idea that small continuous incremental variational change is the sole cause of phenotypic evolution continues to be challenged by 
qual qualitatively discontinuous changes that also needed to be accounted for uh, by evolutionary theory. Let me give you a couple examples of biochemical systems that I think are really elegant and complex. Uh, you have, for example, uh, digestive enzymes that are present in your body that help you break down food as it goes through your digestive tract. And what's elegant about some of these enzymes is that when they're produced in the cells that produce them, they're completely inactive. But they get activated, they get turned on by some other enzymes, and sometimes even by some of the same types of enzymes that they are. In other words, chymotrypsin gets activated by first a cleavage event that occurs by way of trypsin, and then chymotrypsin, uh, another cleavage event occurs, and we remove uh, some amino acids from this chain, and now we have a functional active chymotrypsin, which can then go and digest up proteins in your diet. How crazy and amazing is that? Not only that, and I'm not showing you this on here, but some of these enzymes have very uh, finite regions of pH levels where, they're, where they operate. If you're familiar with the digestive tract, you'll know that some parts of it are very, very acidic. And some of these enzymes are optimally active at very low pH, very high acidity. In other words, they're not active in your cells, which is more of a neutral pH, they have to be excreted into your digestive system, at which point they'll be activated and be able to digest up the food that you're eating. How crazy is that? That's a design system. That's an element of a design system. What about insulin signaling? You all are probably ready for lunch. You're getting close to it, right? Uh, at this point, most of your breakfast is gone, and so glucagon signaling is starting to prevail, and insulin signaling has gone down. But once you eat... All right, the pancreas gets signals that say, look, blood sugar levels are going up, so glucagon signaling is going to decrease. Insulin signaling is going to go up. So insulin is going to now start signaling to the cells throughout your body. But again, this is a very complex process. Insulin is going to bind to the insulin receptor. Insulin receptor is going to get phosphorylated to activate it. It's going to then activate the insulin receptor substrate, or IRS, not the tax people. Uh, the IRS protein is then going to go on and activate a cascade, which is going to bring about a series of events. I'm not going to bore you with all of the details, but just a couple. One is that glucose transporters over there on the right-hand side are going to be moved to the cell surface in order to bring in glucose so that your cells can get the sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cells so they can do what they need to do. The other thing that's going to happen is growth and survival effects are going to be mediated then inside the cell uh, by those same signaling factors. Well, what's going to happen with the glucose? Glucose is going to go through what we call glycolysis, so it's going to get phosphorylated in the glycolytic pathway by hexakinases, and then it's going to get converted to, from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and then it's going to get cleaved into dihydroxyacetone phosphate, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, right? Each one of these steps requiring separate enzymes. Each one of these enzymes is separately regulated. Amazingly, the enzymes are optimally active in ranges that match what your body needs them to be active at in order to import the, the sugar when you need it and not when you don't need it. Amazingly, we have hexakinases in our liver that can import or that can phosphorylate glucose and keep it in the liver only when there's an excess so that the liver doesn't suck up all the glucose before the rest of the body gets what it needs. Is this not evidence of a design system? Inner, interdependent complex system here? All of these features are working together to allow us to survive. Think about the production of proteins. That involves this complex we call the ribosome. The ribosome is a massive structure in the cells. Uh, it involves at least 80 different proteins and five different RNA chains. Some of those RNA chains are absolutely very, very long, hundreds and thousands uh, of nucleotides long. Uh, but we also require things that we call tRNA adapter molecules to, to place the right amino acid in the right spot at the right time and, and on and on. In fact, uh, Francis Crick um, and, and James Watson had this idea. Crick's idea was that there would be an adapter to go from the nucleic acid language to the amino acid language. And James Watson didn't like the idea. He said, I did not like the idea at all. More to the point, the adapter mechanism seemed to me too complicated to have ever evolved at the origin of life. But amazingly, Crick was right. Now Crick, again, believes in directed panspermia. He believes life was placed here. But he says, we have the, essentially, we do have tRNA molecule adapters that allow us to go from the nucleic acid language to the amino acid language, something that James Watson said, well, I don't even believe that would even be possible. 
I study an enzyme in the laboratory, and this is what I'm going to close on, called DNA topoisomerases. They're fascinating enzymes that undo knots and tangles in your DNA. I don't know if you ever realize this, but you have six feet of DNA in every one of the cells in your body. And that DNA, that's a lot. Some of you are like, I'm not even six feet tall, right? But you have about six feet worth of DNA in every cell in your body. Think about cramming that into a tiny space. What if we had ropes that were hundreds of miles long crammed into here? What would happen to those ropes over time? Could we keep them straight? Right? They'd get all tangled up. They'd be all messed up. And that's essentially what can happen in our genome is that we can get knots, tangles, we get supercoiling, and all these problems have to be alleviated. And so we have an entire family of enzymes, and this is an example of one, topoisomerase 2, uh, that actually can perform an elegant function. I'm not going to walk you all, all the way through this, but this is a pair of molecular scissors. It creates a temporary break in the DNA. It can pass another piece of DNA through that break, and then it can put the DNA back together. How amazing is that? It's just an accident, right? I just, I, I have a very hard time believing that this elegant mechanism, which exists in every known life form, every life form that we know of, requires this enzyme to survive. Every one of them, without exception. And even some viruses encode these enzymes. The question is, how could the original topoisomerase have ever evolved to do what it does? You, do you have the DNA first or the protein first, right? Where did it come from? My point is, this is an interdependent system with causal circular, circularity. You've got to have all of the pieces together to make the system function, or it doesn't function at all. It has been an honor for me to get to spend time with you this morning. I apologize for going fast and furious and for using a lot of big words, uh, but I hope you appreciate uh, some of the challenges we have trying to take detailed complex science and break it down so we can digest it. Uh, my prayer is that you will consider these things carefully uh, and consider that um, it's reasonable to have faith in a creator, a designer, uh, and that there is plenty of evidence within living systems that not only are we unevolvable, uh, we're highly complex. Uh, and hopefully that points you to our Savior, since as we know, our bodies are decaying and wearing out and breaking down, and our only hope really is Jesus Christ. Thank you. If these kinds of things are of interest to you, then we encourage you to go to our website at apologeticspress.org and look at the offerings that we have there available for free. We have other products that are available for purchase that we print or that we produce and sell DVDs and books and, and several other offerings there. If you have any specific questions that you might have for me or any of the people at Apologetics Press that, could, uh, that that might be relevant to, we encourage you to email us at mail at apologeticspress.org. Thank you very much for your attention.